Um, and I'd like to thank uh, the executive of Ixan, um, the planning committee of this uh, conference, uh, the distinguished panel, um, um, and um, all the members of the of Ixan, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you uh, for the invitation to chair this panel. And um, I think we're very privileged to have been here and to have heard um, Mr. Jayola, who is actually my um, I'm quite we're, we're quite involved in um, the NESG um, as a company, but also I think for me, the equality in law section of um, uh, fora of the NESG is something that I've been quite involved in. So Mr. Jayola is uh, not a stranger to me and also the collaboration on the United Nations Global Compact. So I came here really excited and looking forward to his speech. And as usual, he did not disappoint in the sense that he basically told us the brass tax. This is what we need to do to be competitive in not just Africa, but just to be competitive globally. You know, we, like he mentioned, we talk about Africa rising. We talk about Nigeria being the giant of Africa. And if Nigeria is to rise with Africa as it rises, there are certain things we need to look inwards and fix. And so um, his um, presentation and his speech was really for us to focus on the right things rather than focus on the wrong things. There is no doubt that the AFCTA has tremendous opportunities. In fact, that every piece of legislation has opportunities as well as challenges, but it is the mindset with which we collectively bring to those opportunities that determines, uh, to, to that legislation that determines whether we see them as opportunities or we see them as threats and whether we're able to capitalize on them. I'm aware that I am addressing um, my colleagues, uh, distinguished colleagues. And so I think in the midst of all of this, you must be asking yourself, well, what does this mean for me as a company secretary? As a chartered secretary, what does all of this mean for me? What role do I play? And before I hand over to the discussants to give their um, views on Mr. Jayola's comments, um, and on his presentation. I, I want us to, I just want us to, able to, to be able to get the maximum benefit out of all of these sessions, to begin to look at ourselves and our role and begin to say, well, what can I do to make things better? What can I do to position my company? What can I do to even position the company, the country, in a way where we can benefit. What can we do from the point of view of chartered secretaries working in the manufacturing sector and in all sectors generally to take advantage of the AFCTA? Uh, and I think it holds, like Mr. Jayola, great opportunities for Nigeria. If we are only able to look at this um, from the right perspective, for the Chartered Secretary or the governance professional, I would say that we need to look at the general legal compliance and policy um, advisory. We need to actually really study the agreement and then look at it in the context of our national laws and see where the gaps are. I think that's the challenge of Mr. Jayola. Where are the gaps and fill the gap? Find out the gaps, identify the gaps and fill the gaps. Um, what are the things that are specific trade-related issues that we need to lobby for policy change on? Um, the other thing we need to do is to look at, um, you know, the, 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 within Africa, we have English speaking and we have Francophone countries. And so we don't have um, harmonious, there is no harmony or, or harmonization across when it comes to even corporate governance, 
um, codes. However, the principles are the same. And Mr. Jayola challenged us to say, how can we improve our own corporate governance practices, not just within our environment or within our companies, but how can we make ourselves a lot more competitive? And so I think there needs to be some inward looking identifying those countries that we want to access or our companies want to access and then doing that gap analysis to say what do I need to do to be able to compete or to be able to enter those environments. Um, and then we look at, like I said, establishing sound corporate governance practices, um, alignment, harmonization, we spoke about. And then, of course, there are other things like interregional payment systems, which are crucial for AFCTA's success. Um, and so, you know, our comp the compliance requirements that arise as a result of that are some things that we also need to pay attention to and begin to address. I'm, I, I think it may have been deliberate that he did not speak about fintech and um, cryptocurrency and digital currencies, but these are things that we really seriously need to take into consideration when we are looking at our ability to access other African markets effectively and efficiently. Um, I'm going to now hand over, or sorry, to get responses um, from our discussants. And our first discussant has been introduced, um, engineer Professor Simon Wange, who is a lecturer at the University of agriculture in Makwadi. Just hand over for, oh yes. Thank you, sir. I think you may be muted, you may sir. Be muted, sir. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Can, yes we can. Yes we can, yes we can, yes we can. All right, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be part of this uh, conference uh, virtually. And I'm happy to uh, be discussing such a technical paper that has been presented by uh, our colleague over there in Lagos. Uh, my intervention basically will be to break down uh, the paper in line with what the chairperson of the uh, chairperson has just uh, uh, talked about. Uh, these were the issues that uh, I wanted to look at, the issues of the legal, the legal and the policy environment, the trade-related issues, the trade practices and how do we align them, the issues of harmonization, payment systems, and basically uh, from my own experience. But let me start by saying that uh, maybe on a very controversial note, uh, let me start by saying, I first came across this uh, institute in 2016 and it was at the National Assembly when we were considering a bill sponsored by Senator Fatimat Raji Rasaki from Ekiti Centra. And uh, the bill was actually on the repeal of the Nigerian Export Processing Zone Authority and enactment of the Nigerian Industrial Development and Zones Commission. Uh, under Section 63A of that bill, uh, it specified that the secretary to the commission shall be qualified to practice as a legal practitioner in Nigeria. Now, I had no problem with the bill specifying that the secretary of the commission must be a legal practitioner. But where I had a problem was when it came to the issue of who the managing director should be, there was no specification. No specification. And I was leading the team of engineers to the National Assembly on that, uh, at that time. Uh, incidentally, uh, my co-discussant, Shola Obadimo, was the executive secretary of the Nigerian Society of Engineers. 
And I insisted that the position of the managing director, it must be so stated in the act, in the bill, that it must be an engineer with experience in industrial and economic development. And that created a lot of problems at the National Assembly. And uh, somebody now said, but why should the secretary be a legal practitioner when there is an institute of chartered secretary? Why make it in the law that the secretary must be a member of the Institute of Chartered Secretaries. So I was hearing about that uh, for the first time, but it also occurred to me that at that time, at that time at that the secretary to the federal government was an engineer. So I said, okay, so we engineers too can be secretaries. So I think I want to use this to bring to the fact that uh, there must be uh, some level of inclusion uh, especially as we talk about African continental free trade area, we must carry everybody along. Nobody must be left out. And um, even though, even though, even though, in the university system, where I belong, we don't specifically train like engineers to be secretaries or lawyers to be secretaries, but. I think this is a job that together this is a job under a institution we can all be able to uh, carry out. Now, having said that, let me talk, to, talk about the issue of the legal and the policy framework. I am the national president of Young Farmers, Processors and Marketers. And recently I met with um, uh, Francis Olawale, I think, is the honorary treasurer of it. Uh, Tai Woganiat Olusesi, the registrar CEO, CEO. We met at the National Assembly once again for a public hearing. Why they came for the Ixan public hearing, I was there for the public hearing that had to do with the repeal of the Export Prohibition Act. Now, the issue is this you have African continental food area. And then you have an act of the National Assembly that prohibits the export of manufactured, including manufactured agricultural goods out of the country. And then you are talking about how do we take the of the African continental free trade area. Yet we have laws that completely prohibit the export, for example, for example of, um, some agricultural products like beans, cassava tuba, maize, rice, yam tuba. But the most interesting thing is it's not just the raw material, but the law prohibits the export of derivatives. For example, if I'm able to turn yam into yam flour, I cannot export. If I'm able to turn cassava tuba into gari, the law does not allow me to export. And yet, we know that there is a big market within the Africa sub-region. And there is a law that prohibits, and I am happy that members of the Chartered Institute uh, were there at the National Assembly. When this matter came up, and up to now, as I speak, that law is still there. Nobody has touched it, you know? So these are some of the issues that I think that um, we need to look at. The other issue is the issue of standardization. Uh, I just came back from Cote d'Ivoire and uh, Ghana, but our major mission of traveling to Cote d'Ivoire was to go to a small town in Côte d'Ivoire, called Boake. Boake, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, a, a, you know, they are very good in yam production around the area they have, around that area, and they have a very big yam market. And they sell their yams by weight in the market. Nobody, has, they don't sell their yams the way we sell in Nigeria. And so when we got there, 
and we got into discussing, they wanted to know how much is a kilo of yam in Nigeria so that they can make a comparison between how much they are selling their yams in, in Cote d'Ivoire and Nigeria. And we all looked at ourselves and laughed because here in Nigeria, we sell yams by size and by number. And here is uh, a fellow African country asking us how much is a kilo of yam in your country. But the main reason we went there, we felt there should be standardization because it's very, very important for us to take advantage of the Africa continental free trade. We must integrate our trade tra 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 practices within the West African subregion, even if we cannot do it for Africa. So standardization is very, very important. And the other issue I want to look at is the issue of language. Now, this has been mentioned. Now, uh, it was very embarrassing. Here we are Nigerians in Cote d'Ivoire, and we, we saw our African brothers and we could not communicate. And my colleagues that we traveled together were asking, can't you speak English? And they too were asking, can't you also speak French? And we were just uh, looking at each other. Hey, you, you cannot speak English. Oh, you too, you cannot speak French. And communication was a big problem. But here we are in Nigeria, surrounded by Francophone countries. We're talking about Africa continental free trade. And yet there is a big barrier that we will need to overcome for us to be able to take advantage of the market. At times I asked myself as a university professor, I said, are we training our students only for opportunities in English speaking countries of the world? Why, you know, I remember in, in those days in secondary school, we used to do French. So why can't we bring back French language and even you people that are chartered institute of uh, secretaries and administrators, must you only do your uh, secretary work in, in English? Can't you also do it in French? Can't you, you know, carry out administration in, in English language or in a French language also? So there must be a way of making sure that maybe we bring back the French language to our schools and teach our children French so that they will be able to take advantage of these opportunities uh, uh, going forward. Before I, I will stop, uh, let me also talk about the issue of currency. Now, it's very, very interesting that you fly 45 minutes out of Lagos to Accra and then you are forced to uh, be transacting business in a very different currency. We got to Boake and we had US dollars in our pocket and we couldn't pay for hotel accommodation. They told us you can only pay in CEFA or you pay in Euro because they don't accept uh, the US dollars. And we were like surprised. And uh, I had to go to a bank, spent almost two hours to be able to change the dollars we had to the local currency to be able to uh, pay for our hotel accommodation. So issues of currency, uh, issues like these are issues that will not uh, engender um, uh, trade within the sub-region. And I think that these are issues that should engage our attention. Um, uh, Jair last paper is very, very technical, like I said. As an engineer, I find it very, very instructive. Uh, but I think as a farmer, uh, who is leading farmers and championing uh, yam trade within the uh, sub-region. I think that these are some of the issues that uh, we have just uh, encountered and I think issues that should engage our minds at this conference from a practical perspective. Thank you very much once again for the opportunity.
members of the Institute for choosing this uh, topic for this uh, conference, because um, uh, when I saw it, I, it, it sounded a bit unusual for me for Charter Secretaries to pick this kind of topic, but it's instructive because all of us, no matter what we do, we need a deeper knowledge of the external environment to enable us to do our work better. And when you are managing people or you are managing bots, because what Charter Secretaries do, uh, to the best of my knowledge, part of what they do is to manage boards. Uh, by being secretary to a board, you're also managing the board. So you need in-depth knowledge of um, the environment, internal, external, the opportunities and threats that are inherent in the operating environment to be able to make decisions and advice as appropriate. I also pay homage to the guest speaker, uh, Mr. Jayola. Uh, we have come across uh, each other on several platforms in the past. And uh, even from the time he was in the banking sector, a thoroughbred professional, and uh, he delivered even beyond our expectations. Uh, we are deeply impressed. Professor Atwange also, we, we have crossed our, our, each other's paths in the past, and I'm, I appreciate his exploits and his drive and his commitment to this YAM export uh, initiative. Uh, it, it's a passion for him. And uh, everybody's just trying to contribute something to this country called Nigeria. And, and we have to admit at this point that uh, not many of us are happy at the drift of the nation, the way things are going, but that may be a topic for another day. I, I am just a discussant, and that is to uh, help to interpret uh, or, or discuss uh, Mr. Jayola's uh, paper. I, I think he must be a high chief by now, not a Mr. again or a professor, <laughs> because the paper was delivered so brilliantly, almost professorially, if I have to say so. Now, this African Continental Free Trade Agreement thing is a simple issue. Um, it has to do with what you, as a country, want out of it. That's just what it is. Now, it is not a novel idea as such. There has been economic blocks all over the world. We have the European Economic Community, where there is free movement of uh, people, trade, and services. Uh, Britain decided to do what it did. That's their own problem. Um, but the community still exists. SADC exists in Southern Africa. There is an economic block in, in the East African region. We had ECOWAS too, but ECOWAS, interestingly, didn't work quite well because I know initially there were talks of a common currency and so on. Uh, but all the same, despite the shortcomings ECOWAS might have had, as Mr. J. clearly stated, people in the service sectors, our bankers are all over the West African sub-region and even beyond. So that has accrued onto us some benefits in that regard. Now, it is now taking these regional blocks economically to a higher level or to a bigger level. And that's talking about Africa now as a block itself, where things can move around and there can be inflows and outflows. But as a country, as a nation, the only way you can benefit economically is when your outflows are more than your inflows. Otherwise, there's no gain. And that is why the policymakers have to craft out policies that will ensure that there are more outflows than inflows. So there can be a net gain. Otherwise, there is no point. We have just signed another thing that we don't quite understand. That's what it means. Now, the reason why we are saying so much about manufacturing is because of the quantum of people it is capable of employing. Because if you don't do that, if, you, if more goods come into your country, you are only helping to employ citizens of other countries. That's where the worry about manufacturing is. We are doing very well in services, but we still need to look at areas where people can get engaged because of our huge population. 
and a lot of our youths are unemployed. Not just youths now, you know, uh, across every age uh, stratum in Nigeria now, there is a huge uh, employment uh, problem. So, how do we now do that? How do we make sure that we have more outflows than inflows? Now, we have a lot have been said about the infrastructure situation, our, our depleted infrastructural uh, situation, uh, almost non-existent in some, in, some, in some areas. But um, whether we like it or not, everything has to boil down to the cost of doing business. Because for you to compete within a block, you must be able to compete both on quality and price. There is no point, you know, we, we import a lot in this country and uh, Nigerians are very exposed and knowledgeable when it comes to uh, prices globally, you know, and then with the, with the area of the digital age, where you can log in, you can find out the price of anything anywhere. Another crucial factor is the port effectiveness and efficiency. People bringing things through other ports. <clears throat> For example, I, I'm even bothered. Why, why do we have uh, probably the only functional port in Nigeria, uh, or the two of them in Lagos? We used to have all these ports across our, our, our uh, coastal area. Uh, Worry, Portacourt, LMA, I mean, all of them well dredged enough to take uh, badges and ships of any size. I don't know what happened along the line, and that it, we had a situation where when you have a factory in, in Portacourt, uh, all your raw materials will come in through Lagos. You now put these things on trailers, and then you take them back to Portacourt. Then, when you want to export again, you now have to put all these things on trailers bring them back to Lagos to be able to get them out. All these things add to the cost of doing business, whether we like it or not. And we have no reason to, I mean, to get into this sort of situation. So when you have, when you are, uh, when you have a situation where your cost of doing business is high, how do you compete? How do you compete? You can't force your goods on other nationals. You can only, they can only buy your goods if they find them competitive. And that's just the bitter truth. Now, that is the situation before we now had an extra problem of insecurity. If you have a factory in the learning, apart from the worrying about uh, how long your goods, if you are into export, will stay at the legal spot before they eventually get moved out and probably if you're able to meet the targets that are set uh, wherever you are taking your goods to because uh, you know transit period will affect the quality of whatever you are taking out you know these are practical facts in addition to all of that you have to worry whether your truck will even get to Lagos in the first place because the vehicle and the driver may be kidnapped on the way and then how much is your margin that you have to worry about ransom so when you have this kind of odd situation, how do you compete favorably with goods and services that are coming from elsewhere? So these are issues we have to bother ourselves with. And um, I, 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 there is a limit to what the private sector can do. The, the economic summit group, they, they, they've been working so hard for as long as I can remember. And I know they took this thing to Abuja, the annual summit so that they can have the president of the country there. But we have seen a few cases where the president will be around, he will be in Abuja, he will not come. And then uh, if he shows up at all, he reads an opening statement and goes out immediately. He won't listen to all these presentations that people have spent days and months and years to prepare. And of course, when the president is moving out, everybody that is important, all the ministers, they follow him and they don't come back. So immediately after the president goes out, the hall is half empty. I don't know, maybe Mr. Jawala can confirm this situation. So a, a lot of help is being tendered by the private sector, but not quite being listened to by the, by the public sector. And uh, unless the, there is a voice 
I mean, there is a listening ear to all these things we are saying. Unless there is a commitment to act on all these things that have been said, we will never get out of the problem we have we have uh, put ourselves. And uh, to mention some of the things he also said, which are very practical, you can have a situation where your inflation rate or your interest rate on borrowing is 20% and above. And of course, we all know if you have savings in any banks, you get maybe one or 2% on whatever you are saving. Can you such an economy grow? Then, in addition to that, you have this huge disparity between official exchange rate and uh, the rate at which it is high rate now or above. Because I have a power and era, and then outside you get the dollar. It's for confusion. So, the declining uh, error rate is the conversion remains a problem for businesses uh, because um, most of them have high import funds and uh, how do they survive and how do they keep competitive? And of course, like I said, something has been done by these security issues. My submission, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Obadena. Thank you. Um, I think in summary, what I hear you say is, it is really up to what you want out of this as a country. Um, we have to have the right environment, and we have to be able to create our markets in those countries. And creating those markets at the right price um, and the right quality. There's a lot to do with logistics. Um, obviously, we spoke about infrastructure, but logistics is key, as well as um, the, the security. Uh, I'm just going to take a few questions now. Um, please, when you ask your questions, um, let, let's have your name and, and your question. Please keep your questions very brief um, so that we can try and make up the time. So any questions from the audience or... Yes, any question, please? Uh, any questions also from uh, those on the stage, please, if you have any questions at all, um, it's not really just from the floor. Um, and and um, if you have questions, um, you're, you're online, um, you can submit your questions through the Q&A. Um, and I think the person manning that would, should be able to provide those questions to us as well. There's a question from the stage. Okay. Thank you. So we'll just take a few questions and then um, together before we get the answers to them. Thank you. My name is Taiwo Bengawo Kanagi, president of Institute. Um, I want to thank Mr. Bob for that wonderful presentation. Among all of those things that you said, um, I, I felt touched and I just realized that there is no point just speaking to myself. Let me also say it. When you are talking of engaging the uh, institution, academic institution, and then they said they have done something that you are not asking them, how much of extra influence did they bring it, did they bring it to what they said they have done and then there was a kind of a gap and i was also asking myself we are also an institute the only thing we also do is just about education training a lot of those things most of the time we also sit in the comfort of our institute i will start to want to we, we try to look at our programs a lot of those issues then i also now put that question to myself how much of those external feedbacks do we basically get when we do a bit of um, looking into our program, looking into our, our content, and all of those issues. So was ensuring that we're not just talking to ourselves. We are not just, like you said, a guy in our own, in our own um, settings, and they will try to like have a, a, a real feedback to those things. Um, I will take this back 
to my settings. Thank God I have a CEO is basically beside me. Uh, we can't just come here and put the public. We also need to take it back with the people feedback back to ourselves and also ask ourselves for as much of the program that we also do as an institute. How much of the external influence we get into developing those content as uh, labels for the students and then and then all of those members that we try to, to, to bring in. Um, I felt touched with that, and um, I just said I've taken away that one. We'll go back and see also see uh, how how well do we position ourselves towards ensuring that we are much more relevant, not only to the Nigerian environment, but also the CFTA thing that we are looking at, and then the global work in particular. Thank you so much. Sir. Mr. President, okay, there's a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. My question is that um, the presenter made mention of the manufacturing sector contribution to GDP in Nigeria, which is, I would say, weakly significant. The manufacturing sector doesn't contribute anything compared to what is obtainable in most of the serious minded economies all right so and we know that nigerian market is the largest in africa entirely and we are having the largest gdp currently so how can a local manufacturers in nigeria benefit from this african continental pre-trade area that's my question thank you Thank you very much, sir. Um, any other questions from the floor? We'll collect the, um, we'll take another two questions and then I'll pass it on to um, the uh, speaker and discussants to respond. Any other questions from the floor or online? Okay. So let me hand over to Mr. Jayola. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, let me manufacture again it depends on the school of thought people have talked about the fourth industrial revolution some will even get into the fifth industrial revolution some have asked us that we don't need to go through that era of manufacturing and jump into services if you look at our services today they're doing again like i said 28 percent our service and trade together is about two percent that it give you now manufacturing is 10. but the reason why my friend is very very low again is all these issues we have talked about, but I even don't even encourage heavy duty manufacturing because we can't compete. Forget it. But if you go into light manufacturing, take agri alone and look at the value chain of agri. In the last three, four years, the NDSU have been doing some work around agri. And you know, the more we look at it, the more we get angry. I mean, mark my, not to my, sorry, note the word anger. Because that is one sector that is the highest employer of labor. That's one sector that we concentrate on. You can lift people out of poverty readily. Now, if you look at yield per acre, for most of our smallholder farmer, it is very bad. You will cry. And when I say comparatively, look at Kenya, look at everywhere there, our yield per acre is terrible. And few reasons are responsible for that. Number one, our seeds are bad, which is why we work with the Seed Council to promulgate the new Seed Council Act that criminalizes it. People, people are so fake seeds. Secondly, even in terms of fertilizers, our fertilizers, they're not fit for purpose. People do fake one. And farm practices are terrible. So if you stay in this area and enhance that, you do improvement. First to the small smallholder farmers. And then another area we look at is that when you look at that, I'm just talking about inputs. Even when we have input and we deal with harvest, since I was a young boy, I've read before Nigeria have post-harvest losses. And today, it's still about 60 to 60%. Go and look at those women. 
Anytime it's time for 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 uh, for, for for tomato, you see plenty of it. Price goes up, it comes down. Why? Simple preservation. I'm told they can't preserve potato. What about other oranges? What about other things like onion? So simple preservation, we don't have. And so they got rotting. And those people that work on the farm are not angry. So let's take value chain and there are companies that have done well, and I'm not marketing any company here. One of the reasons I helped Nigerian bureaus when FX, FX prices went up is that they've done some significant value chain and backward integration. And so they will get some of the raw materials from Nigeria. And so where their counterparts were struggling, looking for FX, they have worked with to pretty much people use backward integration. I mean, there's a small company I came in contact with by reason of my work. And I like, 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 like my sister said, I met them in the United Nations. They are in, in, in cassava processing work. Sultry. That woman employs 1,000 people on her own. And it's just conversion and adding value. So we don't add that. If that's only how we succeed in doing, we'll enhance the, the, the quality, we'll enhance the quantity, the price is that reasonable, and we stop importing uh, all of those things. Like, yeah, I mean, rice is one area where people wonder why is that people smuggle rice. I've asked people, we can encourage planting of rice. But price is not competitive, people will still buy. Come to the market, they will tell you this one is this amount, that one is that amount. So how do you ensure we reduce costs? And we talk about cost competitiveness around us. Apart from the fact that all the issues we've talked about, even our bureaucracy, the cost of bureaucracy, how much you get things are approvals going up and about, travel to Abuja is huge. And I know some of us that believe strongly in uh, some of us, Africa federalism and cool. I, I don't care whether you talk federalism or you don't talk it. What I care is that how do you ensure that the individuals and the businessmen are not punished the more? Because if you don't deal with this area of art very well, you are going to punish those people. Companies that are not doing well will fold up. Come individuals will be taxed more. Because if you hold me from Lagos and get your money, as you move those things across to your state, I'm waiting for you. The state is waiting for you. Everybody is waiting for you. Ultimately, the cost of a man who is moving import from Lagos to Kano becomes terrible. Who bears it? It is individuals and coal. So for me, I like critical federalism when we can debate it. But the question I ask is that any structure you have that creates problem to the citizenry is a power structure. Because the whole essence of our structure and chapter two of the constitution is clear, is how do you make the life of the citizen very, very well? So there's a lot around it. So, so that's my question with regards to, to, to manufacturing. It's been proven that unless manufacturing begin to add 30%, unless they're 30% of GDP, we can't take some of these workers. Unless they're 30%, we can't. So which is why for me, in the short run, whether they find themselves in services, whether they do outsourcing, whether, I, you know, I let them get them to work. Work on skills. And I thought the president talked about uh, engagement, advocacy. You know, sometimes we abuse the university people that they don't reach us. But which you have to reach them. They won't reach, you know, I call them ivory tower. So I go and always lock their door. I like creating problems. So I go and knock your door. I will help you here. What can we do here? Because they mutually, we mutually reinforce each other. If, if, we, if we make people, look, if they succeed in not getting the right people out of university, you know the cost to us? We will retrain them. So why don't you make those money available and make sure that we get it right then and, and stop punishing those young people? We, Nigeria has wonderful young people, brilliant people. They go outside this nation and they shine. So what's the problem? Why are we creating bottlenecks for them? And that bottleneck is for us elites. That's why I said the problem is an elite problem. Whether they are in private sector or public sector, in the academia, we are the people causing the problem. I used to find my friends. my friends. I were friends. And I said the problem of university in Nigeria is not absence of money. It's not. Money will come out. Me, I used to work in the financial sector. We float bonds and create bonds that will fund our students and give money to them. If that student knows that once he leaves school, he can get a job and he will pay. Isn't that the way they live in 
developed countries. But where is the accountability? And I've challenged my guys in ASO. Tell university to publish their account. I want a non-for-profit organization. By February, my account is out. Let's publish it. Then you see companies that will sit with you and give you endowment and will trace one thing or the other. And let's talk to each other. You need us. We need you. We all need Nigeria. So those are the things we need to do. Now, I mean, you talked about regulation and go. It's part of the things I have in the government side. Twelve indices that DLO has recognized: language. I mean, I mean, legal regulation and go. We're talking about currency. Look, this currency matter. Long ago, when I was a small boy in Central Bank, we were looking at ECU, other the economic economic commission uh, units. It has shown to us that we don't know it. We don't need all those ones. Money is a unit and account. Uh, by the time you do a, do a structure, what money does NIPS require? NIPS is Nigerian Interbank Settlement Scheme. And we have challenged them. Why don't you create an equivalent of NIPS for West Africa, Africa? It's a unit of account. You exchange it there and debit your account, your credit your account. It doesn't matter which currency you carry. These things cannot be resolved. And so we pretend as if they are too difficult and, and what have you. You know, the issue of uh, the young generation matters to me a great deal. It is very important to me a great deal. In 2050, there are going to be 450 billion, I mean, 50 million Nigerians. 65% of that population will be under the age of 35. If you don't prepare them, they'll create problems. I bet you, you can run away to anywhere to go and read, to go and live, but you have people here. Please, let us work and make sure will make the environment better for those coming behind us. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Jayola. Um, wow. Uh, there is a lot to be said about what we're doing in terms of um, the younger generation. I was looking for some statistics on my own, which I received a few days ago regarding the number of youth in Nigeria that are below the age of 30. And so the question is, the future is theirs. What are we doing to capture them, to engage them, to train them appropriately? Uh, one of the things I just would like to say concerning the Institute, and not just because it is my Institute, but events like this show that the Institute is very much focused on, one, on, on being relevant. Um, very much focused on being relevant. I have also coached or spoken at other chapter events of the of Ixan, and you know we are very much encouraged as members, experienced members, to come and share our expertise. There's the internship program that Ixan also started, placing chartered secretary students in or newly qualified in companies. All of that again goes to show um, that Ixan is very much forward looking. You know, and it's, uh, it, I'm very encouraged at what is, uh, Ixan is doing in terms of making itself relevant in every single sector. I think, yes, quite rightly, as the president said, there's work to be done in terms of relooking the curricula for, um, for, for, for the professional qualifications and just making sure that uh, we continue to be at the cutting edge in terms of being ready for work. Um, I would like to thank very, very much, um, I don't know whether it's my role to do that as chair, to thank very much um, Mr. Jayola, speaker, for this session, and also the discussants, Mr. Obadina, I think we have lost uh, Prof, um, but, um, and also to thank everyone for being so patient. I'll hand over now to the moderator. Thank you.